Dr. Morse, um, one fear that often comes with high-risk pregnancies is that the baby will arrive too early. Uh, how early is too early? And is that something families should prepare for and how they do that? As far as the question for too early, you know, um, when I look at this, I'm looking at babies development of their organ systems and when can they function without our assistance. Ideally, you want your pregnancy to reach term, which is considered around 39 to 40 weeks. Now, there's a range on that. You can be as early as 37 weeks and as late as about 41 to 42 weeks, and that is all considered term, not too early. Below that, you know, when you get to 36 weeks or less, that's when you consider it to be a premature delivery, and some of the risks start to go up at that point. Um, now, there's a wide range on that. You know, if, if your baby's born a month early, let's say 34 to 36 weeks, um, you know, they, they may look okay. And on, from the outside, everything looks all right, but they're still premature on the inside and may need some help from the NICU. And, you know, that goes all the way down to the limits of survival, which is about four months premature. So that, that's the range of what would be considered too early. Um, how you prepare for that, you know, the, the good news is 90% of pregnancies don't need intervention from the neonatal or recession te resuscitation team or the NICU. So first thing is try not to worry too much. Um, but about 10% of pregnancies do need some help either in the delivery room or that extends into needing some NICU care. So what I recommend to parents is don't obsess too much on the what ifs and what can go wrong because 90% go well. But think of a NICU as your insurance policy. So I would talk with your obstetricians about where you're going to deliver. Does that hospital have a NICU? Um, what is that NICU's level of care? And what services can they provide? Get the information. Know that there's a NICU available. And that probably is what you need to know. Um, again, it's like insurance. You want to have it. You want it to be good quality. We hope to never have to use it. Um, my last advice on preparing has to do with what you talked to Joanna about with birth plans. And um, you know, by the time I see parents, birth plans have gone off the rails, right? I mean, you've gone through all these things, didn't go with what you wanted. And now you're dealing with me and my NICU, and it is certainly not following what your birth plan has written down. Doing a birth plan is a good idea because it gives parents a chance to discuss with each other what their expectations are for during pregnancy, during delivery, and then the care of the baby afterwards. So it opens up questions that you can address together. But my most important thing on that is to be flexible in your birth plan uh, because certainly things are gonna change. And we all know babies have their own set of rules and they're gonna do what they want no matter what you write down. Um, so I would be flexible. You know, my, my goal with a birth plan is one line that you have a healthy baby that goes home as soon as possible. How we get there is a lot of different ways. So that's how I would prepare during your pregnancy for navigating what could go wrong. So follow up, Dr. Morse, uh, what are the risks associated with babies being born too early? What could you say to that? So, you know, as you can imagine, it all is very individualized to that particular baby, and there's a wide range of possibilities for certain risks. But to try and answer your question a little more specifically, you know, if you divide it up on how early a baby is, if a baby is, let's say, a month early, that 34 to 36 week range, we consider that a late preterm pregnancy. Again, those babies can look totally healthy and term on the outside, but some of their systems are still developing. So they will have some short term problems and risks, low blood sugars, low body temperatures, some mild breathing difficulties um, that may need some care in the NICU, but they're short term problems that can be dealt with in the hospital and a NICU. And long term, those babies do very well. You know? So, you know, that's the first month. If you get two months early, Again, long-term, those babies generally do very well, but you're gonna have a, a longer NICU stay and may need some higher specialized care. When you get to three or four months, uh, those are more difficult. Those are higher risk babies that do have risk for some developmental problems later on. Now, I will say that babies are incredibly tough, much tougher than us adults. Um, their brains are highly adaptable to work around any potential injuries that they might have. So we're always more hopeful with babies but it does get to be much more individualized when you're three or four months premature. So what we do is we try to provide consultation to parents directly. So if you're admitted with a high risk preterm delivery, we try to come see you shortly after your admission to review your case. We talk with Dr. Gola, Dr. Doback, 
hear about what's going on with the mother and the baby. And then we sit down and we spend as much time as parents need to review. Here's what to expect for a delivery right now. Here's what to expect immediately in the short term and what could happen long term. And that way everybody's on the same page because because it is hard to know the it's not the same case for every parent because every baby's a little bit different. Um. Dr. Morris, I'm going to tie in a little bit of my history and, and let you know how grateful I am for people like you. Um, I was a 26-week baby myself, preemie. Um, spent three months in the NICU, went home, had, had some issues, but clearly I think I turned out. She okay. made it. I made it. Um, <laughs> so part of my history was always hearing my mother tell the story of, you know, my delivery and my stay in the NICU and um, ironically, Dr. Hume, um, yeah. who I think you work with, Dr. Novak, was one of my doctors when I was born in 1979, and he was doing his clinical rotations, and so we kind of made a reconnection at TMH. Um, you know, sadly, it was during our first loss that yeah. I met him, but we had this whole history together, which was very interesting, um, but, you know, I always, I grew up hearing the story of my birth and, and how hard it was for my parents for me to be in the NICU for so long and have so many medical issues. Um, moving forward, obviously we had our loss, but then with our second child, Noah, he went into the NICU. Um, and it's it's not that I remember being in the NICU, but it just sort of brought all these, just these things to my mind of, you know, um, just how hard it was to um, not be able to hold your baby. I didn't even hold our son until he was three days old. Um, part of that is because I was so sick as well. Um, but just even just that separation of not being able to be side by side with your baby. Um, I think the medical part of knowing that they are sick and struggling is one thing. There's also the emotional component of I can't have my baby with me, um, which is a whole nother set of issues. Um, so to go to our next question, um, it can be a very emotional experience for families to be separated from their babies after birth. Um, what is your advice for those families um, during that time, whether they are still in the hospital or whether the families have to go home and leave their babies? Um, what is your advice for them? How do you support them and help them navigate that process? Sure, that's a great question. And um, yeah, like Dr. Hume, I, I've been doing this about 20 years and I'm starting to take care of babies of mothers who were babies. Of <laughs> yeah. Start to wonder how long I should be doing this, but uh, but it is nice to see that. So I appreciate the story. Um, yeah, you know, when, when your baby goes to the NICU and is separated from you, it, it is one of the most traumatic experiences for parents. It, it, you lose all control, both mothers and particularly fathers have this problem. Um, you know, you're thinking, I'm going to be there for my child, I'm going to protect them. And now they're completely away from you. And, and, you know, every parent would switch places with that baby if they could, but they can't and they feel helpless. Um, and we, we appreciate that. Um, we're humbled to be the ones to care for your babies when they're in that situation, because uh, you're entrusting your child's life to us, somebody that you probably have not met before. So my goal and advice to parents is, you know, connect with those providers as quickly as possible. Um, but take a deep breath because you're going to hear more information than you could possibly absorb at one time and, and not remember most of it. So don't worry too much because you will hear us repeat that information over and over again and ask a lot of questions. Um, like you mentioned earlier that you ask questions. That's the best thing parents can do. And ask the same question 10 times if you need to till you remember or understand what it is. Don't, I mean, parents tend to say, oh, okay, I get it. And they don't really. And, and then they're worried about what's really happening. All they know is there's something they don't understand. So it's probably bad. So keep asking the questions till you get the explanation you need. Um, take it a day at a time, right? The, the NICU, you know, the first question is always, when can my baby go home? And it's the one question we can't answer right away because we just don't have a lot of information. So, you know, pace yourself, take it a day at a time ask a lot of questions. Um, I would I would keep a journal. You know, I used to tell people, get your paper journal. I guess now it's on phones or tablets, but however you keep a journal, do that daily um, and write down everything that you hear. You know, if you meet a new provider, a new respiratory therapist, 
write their names down, ask that person, you know, what they're doing with your baby, and you'll get more comfortable with the care that your baby's receiving. And you can refer back to your notes of what we said yesterday was the plan, and, and now what is the plan today, because it, it will change on a daily basis, and it can be hard to keep up. So I would definitely keep some kind of journal for yourself. And it's actually, when I talk to parents later, a nice thing to have later on once your baby's home. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things is uh, I refer to it affectionately as Dr. Google. Uh, the internet is a uh, could, can be a useful place, but it can be a dangerous place also. And, and uh, I tell parents to avoid it, but I use it. You're going to use it. So what I tell people is when you've looked up some of the things we've talked about, the internet is going to show you the scariest version of that possible usually. Uh, come back to us. And I even sit down with parents and look at that website or whatever they've found to try to help them understand, because it's usually not the same situation that they're going through exactly. Some of it can be the same. And there are some useful websites out there. I don't think it's all a bad thing, but it, it can tend to lead you down a, a scary path that you shouldn't go alone, you know, get our help so we can explain things to you. Um, I'd say lastly, take breaks. You know, it, it's a, a long roller coaster for parents. Um, and, you know, you're obviously first inclination is to be there as much as you can. And we encourage that. We want you to be in there. But it's also good for you and important to take breaks for yourself, your other children with each other. Because, um, again, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So you, you wanna pace yourself. One thing at TMH we do is we're an open family-centered care NICU. So that means we're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week for you to visit as parents. Obviously COVID changed a lot of the visitation policies and has made things more restrictive, but we're, we still have parents can come in 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, you can also call 24 hours a day to check on your baby. So I tell moms or dads, if you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and have a bad feeling. Why'd I wake up? Is something wrong with my baby? Don't lay there and worry. Call the NICU. You know, if the people on call aren't sleeping, they're up, they're happy to take your phone call. They can reassure you that your baby's doing okay and you can go back to sleep. So don't be afraid to use the phone, call us, visit whenever you want, but TMH has that available. We as a medical team will talk to every family every day and provide you an update at least once a day, if not more. So once we make our medical rounds, look at all the information that are coming up with a plan, I'll come out to the room, talk with you, or if you're not here, I'll call you on the phone and we'll provide you sort of what the plan for that day is gonna be, answer any questions you have. Um, invariably, there'll be questions you have that you forget to ask when we call, but write them down or call back and we're happy to talk to you again. But we're available as providers to answer your questions 24 hours a day also, as well as the nursing staff can do that. Um, we have services available in the NICU that, that do help with your separation. There's things as simple as something called a scent heart, which is basically a piece of cloth that we give to parents that you bring home and you put it on your skin. It, it picks up your, your scent, so to speak. Um, and you bring that back and we place that in the baby's isolate or in their crib. So that way, some of the bonding that you're losing by being separated can still continue. Um, the baby can get your smell when they're feeding, kind of connect that smell with some comforting things like feedings. Uh, so we do that, you know, simple procedure, but it provides some comfort to the baby and some reassurance to you as parents that you're connecting with your baby, even when you're not able to be there. When you are there, uh, Joanna mentioned skin to skin care after delivery. We continue that in the NICU. We are actually involved in a statewide program right now to improve and make that a better experience for parents. You mentioned you didn't get to hold your baby for three days. Um, that, that's tough, all right? Uh, and you watch your baby, you can't hold them. Um, there are some medical conditions we do have to wait, but most of the time, even babies are very small, one pound, two pound babies on a ventilator, if they're stable, they can be held by the parents. And our team is trained on how to help you to do that, both moms and dads. So we put the babies skin to skin on the chest. It allows the baby to hear your heartbeat. For moms, it's the heartbeat they've been hearing for months. Um, it's familiar to them. It actually stabilizes their vital signs. Um, they get your breathing pattern. It helps to stabilize their breathing pattern. And it definitely helps with your bonding experience. And for moms who are pumping, providing breast milk, it helps for their milk let down to help their milk supply also. So we have a skin to skin program in the NICU. We have a dedicated lactation person just for the NICU, NICU to help you for breast 
pump and breastfeeding. Um, premature babies can breastfeed. It, it can happen. Um, some people don't think so when they first hear about it, but we have a team that works with you directly to be able to do that. And then we have a fairly unique program here in the NICU at TMH of a music therapy, and they work with our babies. They work with parents to provide um, a music, uh, which does help both parents and to uh, help babies also. So that's some of the things we do here at TMH.